Hello, everyone. We are back here again with Amir. Hi, Amir. How are you? Great. Looking forward to continuing our discussion. Since you run Spark Cognition, it's been around for over 10 years, has done pretty amazing work, especially in the industrial AI. Uh, can you talk about how Spark Cognition is using generative AI? It's a very fascinating concepts. And how do you take these LLMs that are excellent at writing blogs and programs, and how do you apply them in a more industrial, massive scale setting. Yeah. So uh, the first thing is that, uh, you know, Spark Cognition has been using generative AI for a while. One of the techniques that I talk about in this book is GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, we've been applying those actually for many years. Uh, most recently, one of the most exciting things that we've done in this field, which I think is probably the largest commercial uh, use of generative AI um, so far, uh, within the field of energy, is what we've done with um, the use of generative technology to create seismic images uh, based on a small percentage of the data that's traditionally been used. So in the, in the seismic imaging industry, you might be scanning, let's say, for oil deposits. And what you have to do is you have to use, let's say, acoustic returns. You've got acoustic sounding devices. They emit a signal that is returned, and based on that return, you, you calculate the geography, the lay of the land, if you will. And that has to be accurate so that it gives you uh, a good idea of where to drill. Uh, typically, the way that's done is you've got these you know, large ships carrying a, a, a towing a net made up of many, many acoustic sounding devices, and then all the data is gathered then it's put into high-performance computing systems, HPC systems, and they crunch through this data, and that's a long process, and it comes up with an image. So we've been um, we've we've created a new technique that allows us to, with a uh, with a model, with a trained model, create these images. Now you would look at that and you would say, oh, okay. So what these guys have done is they've just taken gobs of acoustic data and trained it on a network, and and you know they get this image. There's actually a lot to it. It's not just a bog standard model that you can train. And it, it was a team of many, many PhDs, research level people that took a long time to get to this. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a breakthrough in this field and it's uh, the highest quality such system that we know of in the world. Um, so that's one example of something that I'm very proud of that this team has uh, built uh, on our generative AI platform. And broadly, of course, uh, you know, we talk about this in terms of models that you can build and deploy on our generative AI platform. So for many of our other industrial customers, uh, what they want is maybe not an image, but some very specific kind of text. You know, it's, it might, might be related to, let's say, code, code generation, but in a field that a stock LLM or a open source LLM will simply not provide partly because that LLM may not have access to this data set because the data set is entirely proprietary and unavailable on the internet and has never been seen by any of these, uh, uh, these, these larger commercial or, or even uh, open source models. And, and partially because uh, there might be some special requirements. Uh, you earlier alluded to the combination of LLMs with other things, with other forms of AI. And uh, that's also something that we're able to bring uh, to the table. And the, the generative platform is a very, very important part of our business going forward. That sounds fascinating, like taking the, the generative platform and using it to create uh, synthetic images, which are extremely useful and actually probably uh, can reduce the cost by millions of dollars, if not more, and also improve the, the speed of, uh, of discovery as well. Amazing. Now that you put it in those terms, let me let me walk you through one simple kind of contrast. So, you know, uh, early on with many of these uh, kind of public generative models that were generating images, you would go in and you would say, OK, generate the picture of a, a, of a boy standing by a wheat field or whatever. And it would generate a pretty good picture. But then you would look at the hands of the boy and some, sometimes there were yeah. six fingers and, you know, so on and so forth. So what, what, what's basically happening there is that that system is operating essentially by just doing pixel prediction, right? Basically, what's happening is that pixels are a sequence. And uh, now there's a lot more to it in the sense that it's not just the next pixel, but it's actually 
uh, you know, let's say a vector of pixels at a time, and there might be X missing pixels that the system has been trained to predict and fill those gaps in. So that's what basically is happening, right? Uh, so it doesn't know that what it's producing is a human being. Uh, it doesn't have an internal model of a human being, nor does it know that generally human beings have five fingers, right? So it, it doesn't know those things. So whatever the next sequence of pixels is, now you give it enough data, it gets so good that the distribution of the training data uh, with a very high probability is gonna end up with good images because that's kind of what it's pulling from the training set. But that's different in this scenario that I'm uh, describing to you because you might have seismic data, but you're not gonna have the same amount of seismic data as you have pictures of people on the internet, right? Because in that kind, that volume of seismic service hasn't been done. Second of all, the system has to have a sense of what it's doing. It can't just predict the next pixel alone, right? So not to get too deep into that, but that gives you an example of kind of how you have to combine multiple things. And it's not just, you know, um, relying on domains where you have essentially unlimited data and where you can do a random selection of probable pixels or probable tokens from a source training distribution and end up with a meaningful result. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's many tougher tasks than just training a bigger model. Maybe we should do a, a podcast just on that particular seismic images. I'm sure everyone would love to know more about it because it's very opaque for most people, including myself. You had a book also recently, right, which with uh, generative drawings created using AI as well. That's right. Uh, that book is actually uh, called Generative Art, and it's an exploration of how algorithms can create art. So, um, you know, again, what is and is not AI is uh, sometimes a, a matter of debate. So people today think that, you know, if you use a neural network, then that's AI and everything else is not. But actually the field of AI encompasses machine learning of which a subfield is uh, deep learning and neural networks. So there's a lot more to AI than just neural networks, but sure, uh, you know, generative art has been around also for a long time. Algorithmic art, as it's alternatively called, has been around for a while. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, um, there's, there's certain types of algorithms that show great um, results. And then the whole field, all of, all of uh, research, uh, the entire research community kind of chases that area for a while. It becomes the fashion. And then people move on to something different. And, you know, I've kind of seen this uh, Fuzzy systems, uh, because they were showing great results in controls, uh, they became, you know, the the um, the idea du jour for a while. Uh, Bayesian networks, then SVMs for a while became extremely popular. Then neural networks uh, came back, you know, with deep learning. Uh, and these ideas will continue to evolve, and I think there'll be fusions. Uh, you were earlier alluding to, for example, combining something like Psyc with something like uh, ChatGPT, or in other words, taking symbolic AI right. and combining that with the output of LLMs. Yeah, I mean, I think all those are great ideas. They're being pursued by a lot of people. So uh, I've always been interested in generative art, algorithmic art, uh, also actually uh, poetry assisted by... LLM-like systems. So many years ago, I wrote uh, a program that uh, worked based on uh, the the life works of many of my favorite po uh, poets, and recommended um, you know sort of sequences, which I would then use as motivation. But because I wanted to make the poem my own, I would adapt them. And I uh, published uh, actually uh, one or two of these poems in a column that I do for Forbes uh, uh, several years ago. So um, I, I've always thought that machine assistance in ideation is one of the most powerful things you can do with a machine. And so generative AI now is only the latest uh, kind of uh, manifestation of that concept of that idea. My next question is more about the AI, whether AI will disrupt the job market and should I uh, take my kids out of school or leave them there? But I think uh, if you can talk a little bit about uh, like my kids, as you know, one is in middle school, one is in, in elementary school. Um, 
will they have any jobs left by the time, let's say, they enter the workplace? Uh, and this is a common question that a lot of parents are, are wrestling with, that which field should they go into? What is going to be the future of of work and you you touched upon it a little bit but if you can briefly just uh, talk about the future for our kids and well my youngest is in fourth grade now and he uh, recently wrote me a long letter complaining about school and i wrote him a very serious response saying that you should consider leaving school and uh, here's what you might do instead uh, and of course, every time I sort of indulge him in that and I tell him, you should just go ahead and leave school, he then turns around and gives me all the reasons why he shouldn't. But I actually, I don't think I would be that sad if he left school. I wouldn't be that worried. Um, the biggest thing about school is really social interaction. I don't think that there's many people that are going to tell you that school is the optimal place for learning. I mean, you're totally not with the times if you think that school is the optimal environment for learning. No way. Good place to make friends, maybe good good place to play a few games, you know, do things like that. Um, learning, no. So uh, maybe if your kids want to leave school, you should talk to them about what they plan to do and let them. Uh, but, but to be serious, I think, will there be jobs? Sure, because we'll invent something to do. We'll do something and we'll call it a job. You know, there are certain things that are essential to the survival of a human being, uh, food and shelter and clothing and things like that, uh, and medicine to some degree. Those things, you know, we are fulfilling already using a very small percentage of our active workforce. So if you think about it, everything on top, like, do you really need the perfume industry in order to survive? You don't. But is the perfume industry part of the job market? Sure. So, you know, a perfume industry as large as it is now, maybe 500 years ago, if you'd looked at that, you, you would have been in sort of disbelief. Like, wh why would so many people just be working in this industry that's not necessary for survival? Needs uh, have transformed into wants uh, and desires. Most of the economy is driven by wants and desires, not by needs. And this is something that people should remember, which is that when you go past needs and you're in the realm of wants and desires, you can come up with any kind of a nonsense and call it a job, right? So, uh, Amir, this is a fascinating discussion, but in the interest of time, I do have two more questions for you. One, um, which is an advice for entrepreneurs. So how should we think about starting or scaling companies when LLMs themselves are going to be far more capable very quickly. So does it even make sense to start a new, let's say a tech venture and in what cases and what cases it doesn't make sense? Well, I mean, that's a very uh, deep and uh, sort of a broad question as well. First of all, uh, sh sh should you start a tech venture for sure? Like one of the areas which is completely underserved right now is the integration between software and the world, the physical world. One of the things that uh, has me excited about Spark Cognition is we are doing things with software that drive outcomes in the real world. You know, that, that actually change. So if I if I sort of, again, start thinking at a first principles basis, you know, going back to that needs and wants, if you imagine your day, you say, okay, I wake up in the morning and then I want to eat breakfast and then, then I want to get dressed and I, you know, all these small little things all the way to what you do in your company and et cetera, you drive, you, you do a hundred tasks during the day. How many of those are really totally automated? And the answer is almost nothing. I mean, you have to do your, you have to make your own breakfast. You have to make your own bed. You have to, you know, clean your home. Uh, I mean, yes, there's these, you know, robot vacuum cleaners, but Come on, they're really not that great. And if you really want to clean, you do it yourself. Um, and so, you know, there's all these things that you still need to do. So is there an opportunity to do things that actually automate more, uh, that, you know, add more uh, uh, technology to daily tasks? Of course, you look all around you, there is. Uh, absolutely. But all of those things tend to be in this realm of machines actually doing and acting in the physical world. So that's one area where I think there's a lot of it. I mean, look, the, the the new LLM might be really cool, but it's not making my breakfast. It's not making my bed. It's not um, taking care of my health. It's not driving me to work. 
It's not, it's literally not doing much other than being a, uh, a replacement for Google. So on the one hand, it seems like a huge thing. And on the other hand, it really doesn't change anything on the ground. And <clears throat> now, can it? Yeah, of course it can. That technology can be used to do things in the real world because just like it's predicting words and pixels now, it can also predict and execute actions. But there's a whole uh, value chain of equipment, robotics, uh, sensors, vision systems that all have to come together to make that real. So entrepreneurs still have a lot to do, right? I mean, you know, you you the tunnel vision that you sometimes get in software causes you to, to think that, oh my God, this thing can write code and it can write like, you know, uh, sort of, relatively unsophisticated blogs, and that's the end of work. We're not quite there yet. There, there's got to be a lot more that uh, that needs to be automated and done with intelligent systems. I completely agree with you. I would love to have a robot make my bed. I kind of, that's the, the, <laughs> the least um, uh, enjoyable activity of my whole day. If that's the least uh, enjoyable activity of your whole day, then I, then I, uh, then I envy your life. <laughs> good point, good point. Uh, last question, uh, more on a personal reflection. On a personal note, what has been the most fulfilling aspect of working uh, on AI for you? And how has it influenced your perspective on not just technology, but on humanity itself? Look, um, uh, this is something that I've covered in The Sentient Machine. Um, to me, uh, th this is not, by the way, what I'm saying is not... Uh, meant as a religious story. It's just meant as an origin story. So if you look at the Bible, for example, you look at Genesis, so you look at in the Islamic faith, you look at Quran, any of the Abrahamic faiths, there's the kind of this common Genesis story. And the Genesis story is that, you know, God created Adam and then Adam was different and Adam was special. And why was Adam special? Because Adam had knowledge and Adam could actually expand his capabilities beyond what was ascertained. Uh, you know, the angels can only do this. The planets have been made. They only spin in their orbit. But Adam had knowledge and could do a lot of different things. So again, you take the religion out of it. But this idea of a, a, a perfect form of creation, a great form of creation is something that can in turn create, that can use knowledge to acquire new capabilities. So that has always been in my mind as kind of an aspirational element of technological prowess, which is a great system is a system that can build other systems. A reasonably good system is a system that does what it's told to do and acts within constraints and can only do this and that's what it does. But a really great system is a system that can like do things that you haven't even imagined. It can create additional uh, things. So in that sense, you know, within computer science, artificial intelligence is that part of computer science that's charged with building systems that can in turn create other systems and can solve problems that you haven't even imagined them solving. So it's a higher form of creation, right? So for me, uh, it's been a noble pursuit. It's been a pursuit of, of um, kind of self-reflection, what makes us the way we are? What is it about us that makes us unique? You know, all these types of questions. And at the same time, um, it's kind of the best kind of thing you can build, right? A thing that builds in turn. Uh, so that to me is really uh, a compelling idea and something that sort of captivated me. The more I stop and think about that, it kind of gets me excited again uh, about, about this whole area of study and this area of endeavor. Well, thank you so much, Amir. It was amazing talking to you. We should do this more often and very much looking forward to meeting again, either in Austin or in the Bay Area, whenever you're around. And thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Kuro.